everybody. Life can be scary and sometimes hard. Seems like you got a winning hand until you dealt the wrong card. It ain't fair. But you're not alone. Down and out or high and dry in the darkest valley or the coldest night, you're fine. Cause you're not alone. With a song bubbling in your heart. With a story that gives you a brand new start. You don't have to travel this big bad world. Upside down feels like there's no one else around that ain't right. Cause you're not alone. When it all goes south and life gets tough and you've been knocked down and the weeds are rough, you just fight. Cause you're not alone. With a soul bubbling in your soul. This big bad world all on your own Cause it's better when we do it together Yeah, it's better when we do it together Hello, hello, hello everybody Welcome to the Palaha Chautauqua I am your host Christopher Palaha And we are live on Super Bowl Sunday, and my friend, I don't really know her personally that well, but Candace Cameron Bure is having a live, and I was like, oh boy, this is like the big live hour for the old Hallmark people. But I'm switching my four o'clock usual time because I wanted to um, watch the football game this afternoon here in the United States of America, but I also wanted to have some continuity with y'all and check in with you, and then just take a breath, just take a nice Deep breath after the first month of the Chautauqua. We are in February, which is a fun month for me. Um, it happens to be my birthday month. I'm, I was born on February 18th. Um, but it's also Black History Month. And so there's some cool, some cool things to discuss and talk about here in the Palaha Chautauqua in the upcoming month. It's also Tim Tebow's Night to Shine. He does something on the 12th every year. Um, February, which is an amazing opportunity for children who have Down syndrome and special needs to go to a prom and to be made to feel like the king and queen for a night. It's an extraordinary thing. So I want you to check out, go to Tim Tebow's website, timtebow.com, I guess, and look up Night to Shine. Uh oh, Kim, it's the 23rd. My dad's the 21st, the 15th. We got some serious... Well, back girls here. What's up, Vicky? How are you? Um, and so what I wanted to do last month, I wanted to go through and just kind of push forward with this idea of how do we start making our lives um, really exceptional um, without exhausting ourselves. And so I started the month off with goals and talking about how to set a goal and how to meet a goal. And my big takeaway from that was write it down. And then I brought my friend Tim on and he talked about leadership through love and through communication and through trust um, and creating a culture. And one of the other things that he said was something that I, that I, we hadn't talked about much, but was having a vision, like casting a vision for the thing that you want. So seeing what you want, which is what a goal is, putting that out there. And then I brought um, my old friend Gabby Reese on last week and, and um, I was only nervous because I usually talk about things of faith, and I knew Tim was a Christian. I didn't know where Gabby stood, and I was—I wanted to kind of have conversations about faith, and I didn't want to tiptoe into places that would all of a sudden become, I didn't want to unpack something um, that was crazy. And so about 10, 15 minutes in, I started sweating, like, what if I don't have a question to ask? But what I was so grateful for was that she opened up this whole conversation about taking deep breaths and having an exercise where you can literally just stay at home and breathe. And so who tried that this week? Anybody? Hit your, hit your heart button if you tried that this week. Okay, a few people out there. 
Um, and so what I wanted to do today was very simple. It's a, it's a very simple, low-key Palaha Chautauqua. I have an article that I want to read to you guys. And then I want to go live with you. So get yourself ready. Yeah, that's why I was nervous. Because I was literally like, what if I don't have an, a question to ask her? What if all of a sudden um, this interview just goes bust? Because I'm not an interviewer. I don't interview people for a living. I don't, I don't do that. That's not my job. That's other people's jobs who are really exceptional at it. And the Palaha Chautauqua was never intended to be like a talk show. So, yeah, it was a stretch of the format last week. And, um, and I'm glad it worked. It, it actually was one of those really cool little things at the end of the day. And I think people took away a lot from it. Um, this week, I'm hoping for the same. It's a little departure from what I normally do. But um, I have directed a movie. It was the first thing I've ever directed. It's called A Work of Art, and you all are going to be able to see it real, real soon. We're getting done with the, um, the coloring. Uh, there's a colorist in Canada who's like going to make the picture look really beautiful. The picture's locked. Um, we have our sound mixer working on making it sound really, really beautiful. So we're just like, now we're putting the flesh and the hair and the clothes on this movie that's really beautiful. And it is a pro-life movie in the sense that it's an anti-suicide movie. Um, so trigger warning here, because I'm talking about suicide for a second. But, um, and it has this really powerful, profound message. It was written, the story was written and conceived by this young girl named Sylvie Pratt, who's been on the show before. She's a friend of mine who's at NYU. Her father teaches at my alma mater, Robert Louis Stevenson. They become family friends. And Steph inadvertently sent me an article this week that he intended for his son to read. But I got it, and I was like, what, what is this? And I opened it up. And it is a website. If you want to go um, after this, you can look it up. M is in Michael, mbird.com. M is in Micah, mbird.com. And um, so it's Mockingbird. And I don't really know a lot about Mockingbird. I don't know, but they have a religion section. They have a social section. They have a Week in Review, Story Recordings Magazine. So I'm assuming that it's a, a periodical that you go to every week. Um, and this is called Grace and Practice TV Week in Review. I was sent an article written by David Zoll. That's Z as in zebra, A-H-L. He wrote this on February 5th. I reached out to David and I asked him if I could read this on the Palaha Chautauqua. And he said, absolutely, please do just give me credit for it. So everything that you're about to hear me say came out of the brain of David Zoll. Um, and I hope I'm pronouncing his last name right, Zoll, like Roald Dahl, I guess, David Zoll. And um, I just want to read this to you guys. And then after I read this, we can open up, um, I want to open up the party line and I want to bring you guys on because there's a whole bunch of people that want to jump on live today. So um, let's, let's get going with the Palahash Takwa today, okay? So the title of the article is Another Week Ends Norman Rockwell, Ted Lasso. And Isaiah's coup de grace, coup de gras, coup de gras. Now, a coup de gras, by the way, is the death blow in French. It's a mercy killing. It's the last poof, act of mercy one can give. Um, here we go. Ready? I received a remarkable gift for Christmas. Um, the kind a grown man shares uh, on Instagram. No, not the mint condition New Wave Dave that the other brother gave me. I'm referring to something from the other brother a print of Norman Rockwell's 1957 painting, Lift Up Thine Eyes. That's the painting. So there's people walking, there's a guy on a ladder, he's putting up this little sign, there's the cathedral, and we go up. So perhaps you've seen it. In classic Rockwell style, there's a conceit to it, almost a punchline, a New York City sidewalk filled with shuffling people, all staring at their feet while a church custodian places the final letters of that week's message in the announcement box. Lift up thine eyes, it reads. Quoting Isaiah, the church in St. Thomas, the church is St. Thomas, Fifth Avenue. Now, do you guys, on my Twitter account, you know I've written that thing and I've penned it. And one of the things that I have written is look up when you walk. And when I was in high school, I remember walking around sort of shuffling and, and looking down at my feet. And I realized what that looked like, the posture, I looked like this kind of, you know, like I was just this big, tall, hunk, and sort of coward, like 
cowardly, kind of like, you know, defeated. And one day I told myself, dude, you got to look up. You got to look up when you walk because what you're missing is everything in the world. You're missing all your fellow students. You're missing beauty of nature, the surroundings that you're in. Anything that's happening in the sky is completely oblivious to you if you're just head down. So this article really, really struck me. Back to it. Uh, Rockwell's vertical composition employs every trick in the book to draw the eyes upward. The railings, the arches, the ladder, the birds, it's all meant to underscore just how much the crowd is missing. Their posture obscures the vast majority of what there is to see. Not just God, but, well, all the beauty and freedom on offer in the world itself. I'm going to reread that line. The posture obscures the vast majority of what there is to see. Not just God, but, well, all the beauty and freedom on offer in the world itself to say nothing of the faces of their fellow humans. Some of the people look like they're rushing somewhere. Others look heavy burdened and sad. A few look distracted. I'm not sure it matters. I just know their posture is the same as that of the Israelites that Isaiah was addressing two plus millennia earlier and of us today. Indeed, everyone who sees the painting notes how the subjects might as well have smartphones in their hands. One can only assume that there's something timeless and, dare I say, universal about human beings casting their eyes to the ground. Our default perspective is limited either by choice or experience or biology or all of the above. Curved in is how Luther put it, I think, and the diagnosis is apt. A curved in existence will be a lonely one. Not just because you never look other people in the eye, but because other people become obstacles to where you are going. And then he has this beautiful thing. This guy has, David has compacted, he's, he's brought together all of these different sources from the week prior to come up with a, a theme or a thesis. And it's really genius. I ex highly recommend you read this after I do. Writing in the Atlantic this week, last week, Amanda Mole noted how the pandemic has erased entire categories of friendship. Her point was that health protocols have eliminated interactions with those on the periphery of our lives, the cumulative effect of which is worrying. And now he quotes from Amanda Mole, friendly chats between customers and delivery guys, bartenders and other service workers are rarer in a world of contactless delivery and curbside pickup and the pandemic. In normal times, those brief encounters tend to be good for tips and Yelp reviews, but they also give otherwise rote interactions a more pleasant human texture for both parties. To have our own humanity reflected back at us, strip out the humanity and there's nothing but the transaction left. Moreover, people on the peripheries of our lives introduce us to new ideas, new information, new opportunities, and other new people. If variety is the spice of life, these relationships are the conduit for it. I'm going to pause again and I'm going to say this. I have recently been in contact with two people who live in New York City, neither of whom I've spoken to since before the pandemic started. And so in my worry of taking care of myself and my family and our health and our needs, and of course there's the Palaha Chautauqua, which makes me feel very sort of connected with everybody here, um, I'd forgotten to reach out to friends that, that I otherwise would have sort of reached out to um, normally because of these weird, um, because of these weird times. So my challenge to you this week is reach out to somebody, family and personal that you haven't talked to in over a year. Go back through your phone and be like, who haven't I spoken to in a long time? Because I know this community has built a lot of awesome friendships for people, which is great. Um, and I love that I can jump to one o'clock live and still have this awesome, like people who jumped in. I'm sure everybody in Europe is loving this right now because it's like normal, healthy time. Um, see where we're at. Okay, the danger of only interacting with people, I'm back to David now. The danger of only interacting with people you know extremely well is that you get trapped in a kind of punishing sameness. And in terms of Rockwell's paintings, it's a lot easier for those eyes to remain downcast when you think you know what's going to come out of the mouths of your loved ones. No alarms, no surprises. Mole is convinced that when life returns to normal, we'll be more grateful for all the casual relationships in our lives, and maybe so. But perhaps we're already seeing a renewed premium on a friendship as a sustaining force. Here he quotes, I loved the story, also in the Atlantic this week, about two middle-aged guys 
who've walked 30 minutes every week for the past six years to give each other a high five. As life has dealt them ups and downs of plenty over that period, the high fives have transformed from a sweet but minor gesture to a means of survival and grace. There's nothing to be said for regular embodied interactions with those outside your household and or office. A long haul relationship with someone who doesn't need anything from you beyond a fist bump. I'm pretty sure that is why small groups and churches are so effective. The seemingly pointless get together, the easiest thing to bail on becomes the mast of the ship when the storms arrive. Alas, such stories are newsworthy because they are so rare. In practice, they, the pull of convenience and self-protection, i.e. control, seems to draw our eyes inexorably back downward. We scan the horizon for an easier way to get the rewards of being loved without submitting ourselves to the mortifying ordeal of being known. Basically, any format for connection where we don't have to risk anything in order to gain some approximation of love, which ultimately is the heart of what we're talking about with kingdom living. It's about putting yourself out there over and over and over again with grace and patience and peace and kindness and joy and love for other people, right? Not for what we get. So now he's getting into like social media stuff. Uh, Parul Chagall's review of the novel, I'm most excited to read at the moment, Lauren uh, Euler's Fake Accounts, it came out last, it came, so the book Fake Accounts came out last week, captures the dynamic with devastating humor. Uh, it was a punishment for Dostoevsky's characters to be tormented by all those voices, internal and external. Now we call it being connected. So many people, Euler writes, talking, mumbling, murmuring, muttering, suggesting, gently reminding, chiming in, jumping in, just wanting to add, just reminding, just asking, just wondering, just letting that sink in, just telling, just saying, just wanting to say, just screaming, just whispering, all in lowercase letters, in all caps, with punctuation and with no punctuation, with photos, with GIFs, with relinks. Pay attention to me. She's describing a situation in which our need has rendered other people props in our quest for validation. Eyes planted firmly groundward probably goes without saying that social media is tailor-made for this pursuit. Indeed, it is monetized, that drive in er. David, it sounds like he's reluctant to use this next word. Unprecedented fashion, which two weeks ago won the most overused word of the year last year. Along those lines, if you missed Shoshana Zuboff's The Coop We're Not Talking About in the New York Times last week, I can hardly think of a more important article to read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest. Professor, uh, Professor Zuboff gets underneath all the headlines and how those headlines hit home in our hearts in a way that's by turns frightening and hopeful, not to mention undeniable. So her article, most of it, he's saying, it boils down to a Weezer song, which I'll try to play like a few seconds of it, but I don't want to get... Uh... So it's called Weezer Numbers. And it goes like this. There's always a number that'll make you feel bad about yourself. You try to measure up, try to measure up to somebody else. Numbers are out to get you. Number Numbers are out to get you. Um, so look that song up, Weezer Numbers. Of course, we religious folks have our own way of keeping attention focused on our belly buttons and the feet rather than the faces of those surrounding us. Church itself can become a means of avoiding the God of grace, depicted in the painting as doves, pigeons, flying anywhere the wind takes them. The religious impulse instead involves keeping God shackled firmly to the ground. We do this chiefly by insisting that he remain a cosmic accountant, do we not? Perhaps the best takedown I've read of this impulse and the wreckage it causes comes in Taylor Cowdwell's half-bonkers, half-prophetic novel, Bright Flows the River. The uptight protagonist, Guy Gerald, is speaking with his freewheeling father, Tom, who sounds uncannily like Robert Capon. Tom tells his son, a strictly virtuous and dutiful man or woman is a great sinner in spite of Bible shouting and going to church and living a good life because they don't love. They didn't love. They sinned against God himself, who is a God of love. He paused. God has been listening intently, and now his dark face was lighted by a brief smile. He said, I guess then that God must love you a lot, you being a great sinner, Pa. And Tom grinned antically. 
playfully. Well, I love him in my fashion. Most sinners do. Only the virtuous really hate him in their hearts. They think he's a taskmaster. Taskmaster, full of hate, too, for anything beautiful and joyous and delightful. And deep in everybody's heart is the sure knowledge that joy is a celebration of the God of joy. So the virtuous deny joy because they think God is purely a God of wrath who must be appeased at any cost. Though they know by instinct that's wrong. That's what's always led to religious cruelty and persecutions in the name of a God of hate who doesn't exist anyway. So that is from the book, um, Bright Flows the River. Those who conceive of God as fundamentally a taskmaker or a lawgiver rather than both lawgiver and law fulfiller will keep their eyes down. Thank you very much. Too scary to lift our gaze or open our hearts. Better to point out the failings of our neighbors, especially if it keeps the scrutiny off of us. And there's another really cute song that he's added to the article, which I won't play. Alan Jacobs took a long uh, took a look this week at how the same religious impulse has found its way back into not so polite society in a brilliant post on which he calls catharsis. He's after. Um, a more accurate way of describing what's at work in the cancellation rodeo we are seeing playing out all around us, a term which itself has been canceled. He begins with an observation of the prevalence among those committed to social justice, especially on our university campuses, um, of a sense of defilement. The very presence in one social world of people who hold fundamentally wrong ideas about race and justice is felt as a stain that must somehow be scrubbed away. As long as such people are present, one experiences a catharsia, impurity, defilement. The filth must be cleansed. The community must be purged. I'm choosing the spelling catharsis with a K rather than C to focus on this archaic meaning. This kind of thing is sometimes referred to as scapegoating. But it isn't, not at all. Essential to scapegoating is the belief that the unclean social order can be made clean by casting out or sacrificing something that is itself pure and undefilable. In the case I'm describing here, the logic is more straightforward. The one who is perceived to bring the defilement must himself or herself be expelled. Scapegoat rituals have a complex symbolism. Catharsis culture does not. Reversal on the artistic merit of transgression, which Laura Kipnis reflected on somewhat definitively here, and I, in my own way, tried here. Um, you gotta go and there's links, you can do all the way through. You'll note that the further up one's rises in, uh, so you'll, you'll note that the further one rises in the Rockwell painting, the cleaner and less defiled the surroundings. Let me get that again. Um, hang tight, kids. So look at this. Here's the painting again. And you'll notice it says that the further one rises up in the Rockwell painting, the cleaner and less defiled the surroundings and the stains on the sidewalk. Uh, meaning, if you're only looking at the shoes of the person in front of you and the stains on the sidewalk, all you'll see is defilement. God help you if you look too closely in the mirror. Speaking of public Purgation. Former New Republic editor Leon uh, Weislatier penned a tsunami of a column for Liberty's journal about the hunched perspectives we all inhabit, for both better or for worse. So here he's bringing back this idea of looking downward and being hunched over. One of the consequences of recent social movements in America, hashtag Me Too and Black Lives Matter, has been to reveal how poorly we understand each other. Or more precisely, they have exposed the extent to which the failure to understand others may be owed to the failure to understand oneself. The limitations of one's own standpoint, the comfortable decision that one appears to others as one wishes to appear to them or to oneself. This is nonsense. Though sometimes you learn so the hard way. There are limits to our epistemological just, uh, jurisdiction. The failure to observe these limits is solipsism. And we all begin as solipsists awaiting correction by social experience. Uh, solipsism is the view or theory that the self is all that can be known to exist. So your existence and the way that you are is true for you and for everybody. But your existence and my existence are totally separate things. And that's what makes life beautiful. Um, 
So our uh, epistemological jurisdiction stops at the encounter with other with another person. The enlightenment that one acquires from the judgments of others is owed only to their accuracy. It is certainly not warranted by the belief that a person's identity or socioeconomic position or experience of hardship confirms with absolute authority a special relationship to truth, a Vatic privilege. Go back to James this week if you want to read the message. James is talking about treating people with equality. Because it doesn't. if you look at somebody who's in a station of authority, like a celebrity on TV or a politician or um, a rich person in your town, and treat them better because of their station, or inversely, a homeless person, and treat them worse because of theirs, that is wrong. You're stripping them of their humanity in both directions. Um, what a simple world it would be if pain were a sufficient guarantee of credibility, but it is not. Indeed, the opposite is the case. Pain is myopic and sees chiefly itself, which is the one of the reasons it hurts. Finally, we are all left with the modesty of our grasp. No whole classes of people are right and no whole classes of people are wrong. The um, ineradicability of ambiguity from human relations, the ignorance of ourselves that accompanies our ignorance of others, the whole fallible heap, so we're ignorant of of ourselves, we're ignorant of other people, that whole fallible heap creates an urgent need for tolerance and more strenuously for forgiveness. Historians will record that in the early decades of the 21st century, we became an unforgiving society, a society of furies, a society in search of guilt and shame, a society of sanctimonies and struggle sessions, American style. They will admire our awakening to prejudice, but lament the sometimes prejudicial ways in which we acted on our progressive realizations. In this respect, America should become more Christian. There, I said it. For all our uh, elaborate culture of self-knowledge, for all of the hectoring uh, articulate, articulateness of our identity vocabularies, we are still, each of us, our own blind spots. We should welcome every person we meet as a small blow against blindness. And then David goes back to saying, amen, amen. And yet, as the Rockwell painting illustrates, much as we should welcome those standing in front of us, we seem curiously bound to, own vac uh, to our own vacuum-sealed horizons, even on the busiest streets, at least AirPod junkies like yourselves truly are. So how does a person ever lift up their eyes? What makes a hunched-over person stand up straight? Does it ever happen? Yes, but not through better architecture alone, nor does it happen via exhortation. Um, uh, exhortation. Lord knows Isaiah himself repeated the painting's injunction over and over again, but it wasn't enough to produce faith in those grumbly Israelites. The tactic won't work with you or me either. Neither will, ha neither will behavioral science, apparently. Since it's Super Bowl weekend, I say we consult America's new favorite coach, Ted Lasso. Hopefully you've had a chance to watch the show at this point, one of the out-and-out -out highlights of pandemic viewing. Posted a couple times before. If you haven't seen it, here are some spoilers. And then he does a little preview. Ted Lasso is a comedy on Apple TV about an American college football coach who's hired by a professional English soccer team. Ted, it would appear, knows nothing, next to nothing about soccer. And during the first episode, viewers can be forgiven for thinking they were in for some massive culture clash satire with the American and the stereotypical role of naive bumpkin. We soon find out that great coaches don't have to know the sport if they know dot, 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 people. And Ted Lasso knows people. One of the first people he meets is a lowly clubhouse attendant named Nathan. A clubhouse attendant does the laundry, picks up after the players, gets them tea, etc. The lowest person on the totem pole. The young man is clearly not a confident person, reflected in his quiet, hunched demeanor. We soon discover that he's dumped on by the team relentlessly, made to ride with the luggage, stuffed into lockers, you know, that sort of thing. And so he is taken aback when Ted asks him his name. Nathan, he responds, looking up for the first time. Ted immediately dubs him Nate the Great, and you can tell that Nathan is thoroughly puzzled by the affection. As the season progresses, no one else is really willing to help Ted find his footing, so Nate the Great becomes his go-to. Ted is either unaware of or chooses to ignore the established hierarchy. Slowly but surely, we watch as he draws Nate out, giving him more and more respect and responsibility until eventually Nate is enlisted to deliver a major locker room speech. He's standing tall, speaking loudly for the first time, all because of this remarkable coach who everyone else thought didn't know what he was doing. The kicker comes a few days after the big game, though. Talk about being lifted up. All of a sudden, 
where once there was an automized collective of con uh, contracted players that detested each other, you now have the opposite of loneliness, a team. The walking stain on their pride hasn't been cleansed, but re redeemed. The walking stain on their pride hasn't been cleansed, but redeemed. Or you could just say that what Nate thought was going on and what was actually going on were two very different things. This funny coach, who according to the team's oh-so-limited perspective, looked so aloof and hopeless, uh, knew what he was doing after all. And what he was going, and, and sorry, and what he was doing was providing a glimpse of the same God that Isaiah tells us about in the passage, the God who gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Ted understands instinctively that only grace or intervening love has the power to lift up the countenance to those bent lower than grasshoppers. Nate's downcast gaze was interpreted by the arrival of something new and unexpected, something from the other five-sixths of the canvas, in this case, a goofy, mustachioed American who lays down his authority for the sake of those who resist his every move. Now that is what I call a coup. And there it is, guys. Boom. Read the article yourself. Go to imbird.com. And we're talking about grace and love and lifting people up. And that's what the Palaha Shatak was about. And that's what I've been trying to do since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and you guys are really awesome people because you're doing that to each other. Um, which I love. Um, all right, let's go for it. Let's reach out and say hi to people. Um, we have 30 minutes, so I'm going to say hi real quick. And if you can join me, awesome. If you can't, no big deal. Um, here we go. And we're live with Kim. Hello, Kim. Welcome. Hi, Hi Chris. Girl. How are you? Yeah, I got my shirt. <laughs> let me see. Let me see. There it is. The Malasha dog shirt. <laughs> so funny. Um, I love, I love, um, I love how your community has just grown and blossomed on Facebook and how you've become this kind of uh, keeper of a community yourself. Which the is keeper. So awesome. <laughs> How are you doing? It's it's February. We're in the middle of like the winter. And even though the days are growing a little bit longer, it's so cold right now. How's your how are you with your vitamin D and all of your feelings and are you doing okay? Actually, um, thanks for suggesting the vitamin D because I was having problems with my anxiety a couple of weeks ago and I really helped. Yeah. I thought I remember Chris telling me, Why don't you try some vitamin D? So I don't know if it's coincidental or I've been attending your church services and I did the Hope series that they did and that really helped. Oh, yeah. Do you like uh, Sean Thornton? Oh, I, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. I still have to watch today's church service. I missed that. <laughs> but I've downloaded the Bible app and a prayer app. So I've been um, getting closer to God. You've just accomplished your mission with me, I think. <laughs> Mission accomplished. <laughs> Mission accomplished. Boom. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. yeah. But yeah, yeah, it's a great community. We're, we're a lot of support for each other and check on each other. And it's, it's great. I think it's essential yeah. right now, especially in these times. And do you have anybody that you haven't talked to since the beginning of the pandemic that you've kind of forgotten about that you could reach out to this week and be like, you know what? I've just, I just haven't talked to you in a year and I'm just checking in on you. I don't know. Go through your contact list and see if there's somebody. Because I um I talked to two friends of mine that I hadn't talked to in over a year, and they both live in New York. And I thought to myself, like, my goodness, I, I should have mm -hmm. checked in, and, and I missed the yeah. whole thing. But you know, you still can check in after the fact. But still, um, yeah. Okay. Are you doing well? Otherwise, everything else good. Yeah, just the uh, lockdowns getting to me, you know, being alone and stuff like that. I, I get to see my son and granddaughter periodically, but I haven't seen my mom since before Christmas. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm missing everybody. It's just very lonely. Thank goodness I have my puppies and all of my Chautauqua friends <laughs> and you to keep me busy when you're busy. <laughs> yeah. 
When you're busy, I'm busy, and I'm I'm better. <laughs> Hey, so, we got a, keep we got me a, busy. We got a book to sell. Up, you know? Yeah, I'm thing. working March, on your book. March 9th. I, mean, I know get, we're working copies, on your book. Copies made. We got to get the card copies sold, ebooks sold, and then I'm doing the audio book this week. So there'll be an audio oh. day too. So there's a lot. So we got some stuff ahead of us. Well, I'm starting with the e copy. Then I'm going to get a hard copy, and then I'm going to go for the. The whole kit and caboodle, because I gotta out, hear I'll you. Figure out, I'll figure out some way to get people's books signed, whether it's after the pandemic and we do like a post book tour or like another one where, and I'll make sure that you know that books get signed or I'll do something. I'll figure something out. I know that there's you're gonna come to Toronto. I mean, I should. My book. I should. Or I'll meet you in Vancouver when you film again. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and when it's um, safe to fly. Okay, I won't hold you up. It's good to see you, Kim. I wanted to reach out to you, and I haven't seen you in a long time, so I just wanted to say hi and check in. Okay, thanks. Right, Take care. Soon. Bye. Love you. All right. Let's see what else we got. Um, okay, moving down the line. We're moving down the line. Woo -woo. All right, who? I want to see something real quick. The love episode, there's a hundred of you on watching live right now. From the love episode, did anybody say that prayer that night? Anybody at all? Put a little heart up if you did. I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's go to uh, Seb real quick. Hey. Hello. Oh, your voice. Are you there? Hey, oh, I am here. I'm coming back. Yes. Hang on. Nope. All right. I'm coming back to her. All right. Were those hearts for the for my question? Um. All right, Seb, come back. Where are you? Here we are. Okay, I'm gonna try it again. We had a weird connection. Do 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 do. Yeah, that was strange. Okay, go ahead again. Talk again. It's working now. Yeah, <laughs> it's working now. It was like you were in slow motion. My phone did like this weird thing, like when it was coming on last time as well. So I was just like, I didn't know if it worked. So I was like, do I say hello or not? Or like, <laughs> so sorry. How are you? How are you doing this week? You doing okay? Um. Yeah, I'll say yeah. Okay. It's like, I am doing okay. Like, I know I'm going to be okay. But then, like, as as you know, I'm kind of working on some tough stuff at the moment. Yeah. Um, and it's, I didn't realize kind of how much I haven't kind of talked about the thing that I'm going to be working on next as well. So there's kind of a lot of, like... It's like, what, like 15, 16 years since I kind of buried this thing. So it's a long time for it to kind of fester and, and whatnot. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, I talked about this analogy or this metaphor with you before, where if you lock something up in a cellar, it can grow mold and it can continue to fester and do its thing. But the minute you bust open those cellar doors and light, and all that sunlight yeah. pours into that dark place, you know, there's work to be done. And I'm not saying that it, and I also think that like we are, when we are wounded, here's what sucks about being hurt in life. When we're wounded, when things happen to us or when we do th bad things, um, unfortunately those things don't ever go away. Like the thing is done and it's like building yeah. a canvas and that color is on your canvas and we can go over it and we can erase it and we can add things to it, but it's always going to be a part of the story. And I think there's yeah. something about embracing, like the minute you embrace it and, and acknowledge what it is, but also know that you don't have to keep dragging it behind you too. Like it's okay to let things yeah. go. And when they come up and remind you that they're there, say, yeah, yeah, I know you're there. And then let them go again. And so there's this like, yeah, I think, that's what I think healing ultimately does, right? Like that's what healing is. Yeah. I think the mistake that I've made in the past that I'm also kind of working to like accept and forgive myself for at the same time is that I didn't really know what to do with the hurt. So it kind of just, it sat there. Um, and 
because I didn't really know kind of how to get it out or like let it go or whatever. It just it it did it sat there and it did its thing and it grew the mold and and you know and everything like that and now like later I'm kind of seeing like hindsight's a wonderful thing um a bit of a double edged sword um in a way but yeah but now that I know that that was the mistake that I made I can kind of work on it and and oh. that's what I'm doing and it's fine it's all good you know this article the thing about cancer culture cancel culture and, and about and about like the modern day witch hunts that are ta- taking place in this day and age mm. i think our biggest fear is that something that we've done or something that's been done to us will make other people think poorly about us i think when we think about like well if they know what i did my parents aren't going to love me anymore if, if they if, if if they know that this happened to me yeah. i'm going to be stained and dark and i'm going to be shunned and i think that that's what's scary about if, if we live in a world without redemption and if we live in a world without forgiveness, then that is probably the truth. But I think where the power of grace is atomic is when you yeah. can look at somebody and say, I don't care. I love you. And maybe you have problems that need to be fixed. I'm not, I'm not talking about anything specific because I'm talking about just general stuff. And so there's so many variables involved in this conversation that it, but yeah. That, because you can't keep hurting people. You can't keep doing things that hurt no. people. And then keep having people, that's enabling. And that's a different thing entirely. But I'm talking yeah. about once the behavior is, 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 is done and the damage has been done and it's not being continued forward. And there is a way to say, hey, we love you. We forgive you. Come back to us. And there's a yeah. way to do that to yourself. And there's a way to do that to the people who've hurt us. To be like, I'm letting you go, man. Like, you're done. I'm done. Yeah. I'm done. Like I don't hold like any kind of anger or or anything towards the people who've hurt me. It's just I kind of want to get myself to a place where it's in the past and it, I'm not carrying it around with me all the time mm-hmm. anymore. And like I'll have days where I kind of I struggle and then this worry will come in where it's mm-hmm. like. I'm letting down everybody who has like ever helped me along the way, who has ever said a nice thing to me and whatever. And I don't think that's the case. I, I, I mean, I go through t- stuff where like, you know, this week I'm, I'll feel like a worthless piece of the dookie. I'll be like, I'm just no good. I can't. And, and I, I do, I want to close off everything. Wants to, I want to shut everything down. And then there's mm. this thing where I just have to like take a deep breath and then, and you know, the thing that was the most liberating for me was the minute I was able to start giving stuff over to Jesus. And we've talked about this, where I'm like, yeah. Jesus, you brought this in. Like, whether you brought it into my life or not, whether this was something that you wanted to have happen to me, you allowed it to happen because I believe that God is sovereign and that everything, everything. And I know that he doesn't want bad things to happen to people, but those things are allowed to happen to us for whatever reason. And that God can turn all things into good so that there will be this point at which God will take that rottenness and make it beautiful. And that mm. is through grace, through mercy, and through love, and through forgiveness, and these things that, and like I said, I mean, I feel like your story is going to be this, and is this really powerful story that you're going to be able to tell to people and share with people, and and I'm just excited to that this that me and this little Chautauqua community that we're a part of the ride with you because it's going to be cool to see where you go. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right, I'm going to keep moving down the line. Are you good? Everything else yes, good? I'm, everything I'm good. Yeah, good everything good. <laughs> yes. No, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> you know, honestly. No. Um, Was there something else you wanted to say? Go ahead. No, no. I, I, I don't know. My mind is just like, it goes a little bit foggy sometimes. And like, sorry. No, it's fine, honestly. Um, there wasn't anything else that I wanted to say. Um, but thank you. All right. All right. Well, then we'll see you soon. See you soon, Chris. Bye. I feel like I'm like, bye. So I was like, wait a minute, hold on. Um, all right, what else we got? We got, uh, well, Gail. <laughs> Let's see what Gail's going to say. Waiting for Gail. It's like waiting for Guffman. Hello, Florida girl. Hello. Look at you. You got the wrong, you got the wrong jersey on. Oh no, I do not. You got the oh, wrong. No. You got the oh, wrong no. colors on. Yeah. Oh no, sweet brother. No, no, we're repeating. We're repeating. <laughs> <laughs> you mean to tell me you're gonna root for the Buccaneers? I mean, listen. I'm so 
impressed. I never, I'm going to be honest, I never was a fan of Tom Brady. I was never like, Tom. But I think what he has done with the Buccaneers, I'm like, you know what, let's give it to the guy. If you could take a team that has never been to the Super Bowl or hasn't been in like 13 years, I don't even know when. Ever, has the Buccaneers ever been? Have they ever been? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah they and, have. Yeah, they have. They have. Okay. Um, yeah. Anyway, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just interested. I'm curious to see what happens today. My dog's not really in the fight, but I love that you got your jersey on. You ready to go? <laughs> How are you, sister? I haven't talked to you, and man, it's been a long time. I know it has been a long time. You doing? Yeah. Good? Yeah, doing good. Doing good. I thought this was interesting. I, what you're talking about today about you know, looking up and 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 looking out, and um, it is something we're struggling with right now uh, as a society. I'm I'm a big, um, I love to hug, and I love to smile, and it kills me <laughs> that we're in a situation where we can't hug people anymore, and we can't smile at people. I miss seeing people smile, yeah. um, you know, when they, when we go in the grocery store, you know, normally I would go up to every old person I could see and I would say hi and I would, you know, that sort of thing, just smile at them. And with the mask, you can't, you can't see people smile. So I do miss that. Um, so it's important that when we are out in the store and we're wearing our masks, make sure we smile big enough that right. they can see right. it in our eyes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't it funny how we've learned to communicate with our eyes? We're like, hi, like yeah. you know, <laughs> a whole other half of our face that we're utilizing anyway. Right. You, know, it's, you know, it's funny, um, the whole Me Too movement. Um, I used to be someone who was very, like, I loved putting my hand on an, a shoulder or an upper yeah. arm. And it was right. always safe. Like, I always made sure right. it was like, safe, but like, I wanted to connect. And when sure. all that stuff started happening, I was like, dude, I don't want to be like, yeah. so it, it's weird how there are certain yeah. people who communicate through touch and through hugging and it's very non-sexual <laughs> and very healthy and safe, but who right. have lost that ability to communicate that way because, that's right. because we are hypersensitive these days, and, yeah. but also, yeah. but also because we're also like, I mean, I think that everything that's happening is like this article said, it's good that we've become, you know? aware of the racial inequality in this country. It's good that there are certain things in our structure. Men shouldn't be able to do what Harvey Weinstein did and, right. and the women to make people feel like, you know, like that was, those are eight, you know, age old tropes. So it's cool that everything is becoming aware. It's how are we going to use right for all the good guys and all the good girls out there? Like, how do we keep mar marching forward safely and, and move forward? Yeah. 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 I, you know, one of the things that I think is so important is, and we've talked about this before, is asking God to allow us to see others the way that he sees them, mm -hmm. you know, and that can be someone that you know and love, or it can be a complete stranger, yeah. um, but asking him and, and when we ask him, he will, he will do that. He will help us to see someone else um, through his eyes. And that's just so important. Uh, and I think we need to be diligent in asking him to do that. Yeah. Um, and he will be faithful to, to let us do that. And also, you know, you were talking about that um, show on Apple TV about how um, the coach asked the guy his name. Mm -hmm. It is so important when you hear someone's name to say it back to them. Uh, I have a friend, Evelyn, a, a lovely woman uh, who I respect dearly and the one thing that she has taught well, she taught me many things but one thing she's taught me that's really stuck with me is the importance of saying someone's name yeah i mean it's such a recognition of being known yeah you know and so you know not just to because i also being from the south i tend to call everybody you know honey or sweetie or <laughs> you know whatever and so it's nice to be be very specific and say someone's name. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, to, to say someone's name, to, to, to look up and see people, ask God to help you to see them the way that he sees them. Those are all very, very important things. Yeah. Um, there's a story in the gospel of John where Jesus um, sees a blind man and he heals the blind man. And then Jesus goes away and the, the leaders are questioning the blind man, you know, how, how did you get healed and whatever, and gives him a really hard time. And they end up casting him out of the synagogue, which in that culture was huge. Like 
basically right. just kicking you to the curb. You're on your own. Right, right. You're out. You're out of the group. Yeah. And, and Jesus heard that this had happened, and Jesus went and found this man in the temple, and went and talked to him. And that really spoke to me a lot about the fact that Jesus seeks us out, and if we're going to be His disciples and follow Him, we need to seek people out too. We need to seek out those who are hurting. We need to seek out those who are lonely, and. You know, it doesn't have to be anything big. It can be a phone call, like you said. It could be sending them a greeting card. Yeah. It could be a text, whatever. Yeah, it's true. But Jesus said that the whole law can be like, like if you take care of the widows and the orphans, like, you know, love, love God. And then, and then how do we put that into practice? Take care of the people who, who are not being taken care of. Right. You know, like, how do you look out for the people who are, who are hurting? Right. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. So and, even, and, and it's funny, it's like, it's, it also goes back to, like, the people that we have in our lives, like, you mm -hmm. know, your spouse half the time, like, sometimes there's just days where you're like, I've gotten used to you, and I know you, and so I'm not gonna, <laughs> but like, paying attention to that person and their needs afresh and anew, you know, That's right. like, like, it's funny, I mean, it's just really about being, it's, it, again, it goes back to the full expression of the human experience, how do you live? Mm -hmm fully in the moment, present, and then with love. Right. And I love right. that. I do, I pray to see people through God's eyes. Somebody mm -hmm. quote, uh, somebody commented about, it, it, it kind of shook me, you were talking about, and it said seeing her sister's murderer through God's eyes. And, mm. and God, I can't find it again. But, um, but yeah, like even in those moments where it's so impossible, mm. You know what I mean? To love. Yeah. And in, in something like that, you would definitely need God to help you see yeah, it. It's the only way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Because otherwise yeah. it would be like, yeah. Um, all right. I'm going to keep moving down the line, Gail. You're awesome. Okay. I mean, you got, the, awesome. you got the wrong jersey on, but I'll forgive you. You know, I, <laughs> you know, I cannot believe I finally found your fault. <laughs> I finally Jeez. found your fault. You know, it's like, I was a big 49ers fan growing up and that's the Chiefs. That's where all the 49ers would go after they like retired. <laughs> the Chiefs. <that's> <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye. Ooh, that's funny. Um, all right. We got a few more minutes. Let's see what else we got. Um, man, there's so many people today that want to join and uh, I'm going to try to move down the line. Let's see. We got, Okay, Bunty, I'm coming at you. Bunty is um, always has a very pragmatic point of view. I always love hearing Bunty's point of view. Hello, Bunty Fox. Hey, Chris. How are you? Yeah, hi. Uh oh, your connection. Yeah. Yeah, oh, I can hear you. Hi, can you hear me? Okay, what's going on with you? How are you? Well, at the moment we are. Um, Redoing the house, we're uh, redoing the electrics. So on Thursday, I took the ceiling down in one of the rooms. So, uh, so roof other than that, yeah. well, we've got the ceiling. roof, but not the ceiling. Ceiling, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, some hard work. Good. But yeah, fine. Yeah. How are you? Um, I'm doing well. I'm doing real well. I'm trying to do a little Chautauqua. This week and next week in, in two Sundays where it's hard to uh, to get it done. But, you know, it's kind of fun just checking. You shouldn't, be, shouldn't be doing one next week. You should spend time with your wife. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's what's going to happen. I am going to do uh, – I am going to pre-record one, and we're going to post it Fair live. So it'll be, yeah. there'll be something, but I'm not going to be doing one live next week. You're right. Good, good. Glad to hear that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And how are you doing otherwise? Everything good? You're on lockdown right now. Yeah, right? yeah. You guys are stuck Sorry? at home. You're stuck at home. No, I work. I, no, I work. Full time work. So you're going out in the world, but the rest of your country is on lockdown. If you're not yeah. essential. Yeah, so. that's right. Yeah. No, I'm out all the time working. You? Work in a bookshop. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, work in a bookshop. That's interesting. And it's open still right now. Yeah, yeah. We're we're a lot busy because everybody wants to read because they've got nothing else to do. Yeah. Hey, so we're actually selling you? a lot more books. Are you gonna Are you gonna carry a book called Moments Like This? Sorry. 
Are you going to carry a book called Moments Like This? Don't know. You better. No. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. need your help, Bunty. I need your help. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're, yeah, we always, uh, we're, we're selling a lot more books. Good. A lot more. Good. Very busy. It's good. it's good that people are reading. That's good. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I just wanted to say hi to you, check in with you and see how you're doing. Yeah, it's nice to speak to you. It's good to see you too, Bunty. Okay. Yeah. I appreciate you. See you soon. And then, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I, I, I haven't received anything yet, but I appreciate that. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, it should be there by now. Okay. I'll check in. Okay. Right. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. There we go. Um, I like doing it a little earlier because I get all the the UK peeps in. Which is kind of nice. Um, <clears throat> all right. Let's check in with uh, Vicky. It's been a while since I've seen Vicky. Let's see if she's willing to. Hi. That girl, six, six, six. How are you, Vicky? <laughs> I'm good, thanks. How are you? Good. How's Scotland treating you? That's not too bad. Yeah. It's snowing tonight. It's snowing? Yeah. It's snowing in Scotland. Zero degrees and snowing. Oh, that sounds it's fun. I don't know why, but snow in Scotland sounds like perfect. It just sounds perfect. Like that's the thing. You want snow in Scotland. It's wonderful just now because I'm in a full lockdown, so I don't have to go outside and drive on it. <laughs> right. Exactly. I can just look at it and it's pretty. <laughs> yeah. Let's just look out the window and be like, I can see that. New view. It's a new view from, from home. Um, how is homeschool treating you? How are you? How's the life? How is everything? Oh, it's fine. Homeschool's good. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm really not good at maths and I really don't remember anything from school, so I'm trying to teach somebody is not my forte. Um, yeah. Yeah, but life's not too bad. Um, what grade is your kid in? Um, she's primary four. Fourth, fourth she's grade? Eight. I don't know if that's fourth grade. So she's, she's eight, eight. She's, she's eight, eight years four. old, so she'd probably be third grade. Like, I would think. Is she, did she just turn eight? Uh, August. So, yeah. Yeah. So, maybe she's third, second or third. Yeah, fourth grade. Well, yeah, fourth grade, you're like 10 in America. So, nine nine would be like third grade. So, maybe like second grade, maybe. I watch so like, American TV shows, but I can't work out what grades are what. Yeah, we have a different school system. Our school system, you guys have like 13, right? And then you have A levels, and then we have kindergarten, and then we call them freshman, junior, freshman, sophomore, junior, seniors, which is like ninth and twelve. What'd, what'd you say? Nursery, primary, high school. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Easy. Um, all right, you. I just wanted to check in and say hi. I liked what you said about the whole Me Too thing. Um, like how you put your hand on somebody's shoulder and things like that. And it just reminded me of the time I was sitting outside and having a coffee and my daughter was playing a wee bit away from me. And this man stopped her and asked her if she was okay, if her, if her mum was anywhere. And I just kind of watched it. And um, she's pointed to me and the man put his hands up and walked over to me. And he's like, I wasn't touching her. I wasn't doing anything. I was, I was just asking if... You were there. He's like, I didn't see any mom about or right. anybody with her, and I was like, no, that that's that that's brilliant. And I hadn't ever considered what that's like for a man. Like, I wouldn't think twice if I saw a child that would be like, are you okay? But for a man's perspective, I've never thought of that before, and I, I found that quite interesting. What you'd said about the whole Me Too thing, I've never thought about that before either. Yeah, it's funny. My dad was a defense attorney in Reno, Nevada when I was growing up. And I got this really cool job as a substitute teacher in New York City when I was at NYU. And before my first day of school started as a teacher, as a substitute teacher, my dad was like, Chris, don't touch a kid, don't hug a kid, don't put your hand, just when they walk around you, just walk with your hands up. He's like, because I've gotten so many, you know, I've had to defend so many people from being falsely accused of, of and I think 
obviously there are bad people who do really bad things to kids and that's one conversation but then for the rest of us <laughs> we're like wait a minute and you get situations like that where you're feeling and you should be safe i mean i think that guy was that probably just showed he was a legit dude and um it, it was so nice do you know what i mean and it was just like taking it back to the, how defensive he was and it was like it's fine honestly thanks so much for caring <laughs> yeah, enough to do that do it's like I mean? shakespeare like yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> I know it's crazy times, but we're in it. We're in it. Um, and what so you it, said about school, I remember a story about a wee girl that uh, she she said that her dad had touched her flower, and the teacher had reported it and everything. And the dad was get, she'd grow flowers in the back garden, and the dad was get out and going ooh to the flowers she'd grown and it'd get blown way out of proportion. Yeah. It was just ridiculous. It's, it's crazy sometimes how things can get blown out of proportion just like that. I know it's group. It's the group think. That's what's scary about it. It reminds me of like McCarthy. We had this period in America called McCarthyism and it was a witch hunt for communists. And it was mm -hmm. just like if you and it hit Hollywood really hard because if you were deemed a communist in Hollywood, they they it's called, and they consider it what's called blackballing. Or, and um, you would lose your career. Like you would just lose your career. You weren't able to work and make a living and provide for mm -hmm. family. So people lost their jobs. There was a guy named Matthew Weiner who created that show Mad Men. Did you ever see Mad Men? And his parents, I loved Mad Men. yeah, his parents were a part of this group that was blackballed. And, um, and yeah, whenever it gets political or whenever it gets, I don't know. I don't know. It's a really, it's almost like you don't want to talk about it because it's like, to even talk about it, it kicks up stuff and you're like, I don't even want to you know, get into yeah. that. But, but it's, it's weird. It's one of yeah. these really serious topics that you kind of, if you start talking about it, you end up digging deeper and deeper. It gets, yeah, and deeper it's like a rabbit like, hole like, where all of a sudden you're starting to, you know, just burrow on through. But anyway, check that article out. I don't know if you can see it from Scotland. I'd be curious if you can. mbird.com. And the guy, his name is David Zoll, he put links into the music. So there's music and there's images and stuff. And it'd be cool to, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Thank you very much. It was quite nice uh, listening to you read it. Cool. I'll need to get the audio version of your book just to listen to you talk. Yeah. Well, I'll need there's... to buy the actual book so I can read it myself because I won't pay attention if, if you're reading it. I'll just be listening to your voice like you're very sweet. <laughs> very kind <laughs> all right thank you biggie i'll see you soon nice to speak to you bye. bye bye okay that's it dudes that's it that's it that's it why he should not what i missed a conversation oh are we talking about more than 10. All right, guys, it is time for me to say goodbye. So I'm going to lift it up. Lord, bless these people. Help them have an amazing week. Uh, and help us find grace for one another, patience and peace and kindness and love and joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bye. Bye-bye.